This is Eugene Chan, and welcome to Straight Talk. Our guest this week is Dr. Rizwan Ula, who was born and raised in Hong Kong. He is currently vice principal of a local secondary school and a seasoned educator. One of his research interests lies in the ethnic minorities' Chinese language education. Dr. Ula is also serving on the Equal Opportunities Commission and the Youth Development Commission. He has been awarded the Certificate of Commendation from the Secretary for Home Affairs, the Chief Executive Commendation Award, and the Medal of Honor from the Hong Kong SAR government for its contribution. Welcome, Rizwan. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for having me here today. Right. Rizwan, the topic this week is how do we unleash the youth potential in Hong Kong? As you know, youth are very important pillars for our future. So unleashing their the potential is critical to everybody. And being a member of the Youth Development Commission, you are the, in the best position to tell us what the Hong Kong government is doing in terms of youth policy. So what actually is Youth Development Commission, why it was, it was set up and what actually it does? Well, basically, it goes back to uh, 2018 uh, when the former Commission of Youth was made to a Youth Development Commission. Right. There was a high-level commission chaired by the... Uh, Chief Secretary of the Administration. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea behind YDC was actually to help our youngsters mm -hmm. with their education pursuit, career pathway, uh, make them on board to have their home ownership, engage them in the government affairs. Mm -hmm. So these were the four things that, uh, that uh, the government wanted to do and mm -hmm. the Youth Development Commission uh, had to materialize these things mm -hmm. uh, along the way. Yeah, with all the work that has been done since you've been a member, I mean, how successful ha it has been? And, and can anybody participate in the, all those activities? Well, I think uh, if you look at the, the achievement over the past uh, four years, definitely the youth engagement in public policy has increased. We can see more youth sitting on uh, government advisory boards and statutory bodies. Uh, number two, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, resources deployed to help uh, the youngsters with their career pathway and life planning and also uh, plan a lot of uh, exchange and interflow. But because of COVID, many of those mm. things were not uh, uh, able to materialize. Mm -hmm. So uh, these were many of these mass programs were materialized, experiences were gained a good learning curve was built, and even it was something new for the government as well because you have a commission looking at youth issue and all these different bureaus has to work together to achieve those goals. So it's more lateral collaboration and all these things, uh, I would say, was a big game changer. Right, you know, the last few years have been very turbulent for all people in Hong Kong and I'm sure the youth included. Uh, you had the riot in 2019, then you have the COVID run to today. Um, in, in your view, how has the youth been affected? What are, the, what are the most negative things that you can see that happened to the youth development in this two, two three years in particular? Well, I think uh, because of those uh, episodes, Hong Kong has gone through some very dark moments in mm -hmm. its history. Mm -hmm. And of course, youth has experienced uh, and has been hard hit for example, they, they might question about their future. Things are getting gloomier to them when they see all these things happening. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, the mental health of the kids. And also, uh, when they look at things, whether they, they are resilient enough to see those challenges. So these were some of the uh, things that our youth has experienced in these uh, three years. Right, so you mainly you said is the, the outlook for the future is gloomy, as you said. Also, the, the mental health, they feel a lot of pressure. How about, I mean, often people talk about their outward mobility, whether they can uh, get to university, whether they can get a good job, or even get to um, a place of their own, having their family, etc., etc., etc. Are these really their concerns? Well, I would say it's every uh, young individual's concern around the world. Mm. And uh, uh, Hong Kong, is actually a place where we can see the government is putting a lot of resources with youth work. The community itself, they have a lot of NGOs, 
and other organizations which are addressing this issue. And it's often you need someone who can do the coherence making to achieve the synergy and to get back these kits on track. And they can also feel they are the future pillar as well. They are right. an important pillar of the society. When you said that, um, well, it is very reassuring to hear Hong Kong is one of the few places that the government actually put resources into engaging with the youth. Have we been successful? Well, I would say uh, Hong Kong has faced a lot, of, uh, a lot of challenges and it was a challenging time. I would say it's a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. uh, without these things happening, the issue of putting youth in the agenda would have not been that fast. Mm. And uh, it was in the manifesto of uh, the current administration and I'm sure in the coming administration, youth will also be an important policy area mm -hmm. where we can actually look at. Right. Going back to the title of the show, how can the potential of our youth be unleashed? How can we do it? How can we engage them? Well, I think there are uh, two things we can look at. First, we, we need to look at the mindset of our youth. Our youth is pretty much engaged and connected with social media. And we have a lot of information, a lot of resources that our youth need to know. And how can we narrow the gap of the use of social media? As government, how you use social media to engage youth. These platforms are very important and we need that creative click. And second thing, I think it's, we have been doing a lot of mass programs. Mm -hmm. We need to start looking at how to do things in a one-to-one -one or differentiated approach. We need to cater the uh, youngsters in, a, uh, in layers. Some kids who are doing very well off, their needs might be different from those who are not doing very well. So we need to adopt these differentiated strategies to cater and help these kids to aspire higher and mm -hmm. achieve more. Right, so basically saying that the government or whoever wants to help the youth must make good use of the media and also be differentiated of different groups, be more specific, that's what you're saying. Then you can measure the outcome. Right, okay. And also another matter that we often talk about on this show is the Greater Bay Area is the potential of Hong Kong. And how much has the YDC actually, what, have you done, organized much activities to engage our youth so that they will get access to GBA? Well, uh, yes, uh, let's put aside COVID. But before COVID, I, I remember when YDC was formed, uh, there were a lot of interflow activities. And we also had uh, the members to go up and look at the businesses and the facilities that we have uh, in GBA. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are pretty much uh, supportive of this idea. The number shows it, mm. 7 million versus 70 million. Right, but you know, um as often we see it in the news as well, we found that our youth, even with my personal experience, the uptake of this idea is rather slow because they feel very comfortable here. They've, in a way, they're a bit complacent. So how can we break these barriers and actually push them, I won't say push them, entice them to the GBA to have a look? Well, I think uh, with, with the uh, departure of COVID soon. Hopefully. Uh, I think uh, we need to organize more of these activities, right. but in a differentiated manner. We try to cater different groups like the ethnic minority groups, uh, groups of students who, who are low achievers, and even those high achievers. You, you need to have different uh, programs to create need. And with the need in mind, then these kids would be attracted. Mm. So we need to think from a user's perspective and design activities, this would definitely change. Right. If we stop and think from our own angle for, the, uh, for, for, for youngsters, they might not buy in. Mm. So when designing from a user's perspective and uh, using a differentiated approach, and also more importantly, it's, uh, I think it's the acceptance, mm. the value creation. This is uh, something very important. Yes. If, this, if the students, they don't see that as the way we do, it will be a problem area. So we need to narrow down right. these differences. Rizwan, uh, you know, Hong Kong is very proud of being a Hong Kong person, as you uh, 
I've observed in the last few years, and uh, having a uniqueness in our culture, especially amongst the nation, we are, we are very fortunate. However, however, when you want to move to the GBA, or so-called more mainlandization, there seems to be a little bit of conflict that's been happening. Some people may not accept the, our motherland as much. I mean, being from your p perspective, is it time that the, the, the major factor that could change all that, or, or is it happening already? Well, uh, let me answer the question in this way. I'm a very proud Pakistani. Mm. But at the same time, I was born and bred in Hong Kong. I maintain my own culture and also integrate and assimilate into the local culture here as well. So when we talk about the idea of going to GBA, I think, yeah, sure, why not? Mm. So this is the mindset, I think, that our uh, local youngsters and youth need to be cultivated. The idea of seeing mainland as something organic, natural, rather than having, you know, uh, a smoke screen in front of mm. you or a barrier and say no, then these youth can never develop and never, and it will be very difficult to unleash any potentials. Okay. All right, let's take a break and don't go away. Thanks for staying with us. We have Dr. Rizwan Ula here, and he has been sharing with us how he thinks the potential of Hong Kong youth can be unleashed. So Rizwan, before the break, we talked about your, your, your insights in how it can, can be unleashed. Um, one factor that many people often said is um, the issues that had the problems of the youth that we had in the last few years is the education. And a lot of people put the the blame on to the subject called liberal studies, and now they have something called citizen and social development. So being a teacher, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, do you agree? Well, uh, I think there are many factors right. that, that uh, form a thinking uh, on any individuals. Uh, and w if liberal study would be the one to blame, well, that's what uh, many people said. Uh, I, I don't think so. Right. I think there are many other factors. Right. Yeah. So do you think it's the right thing to modify the liberal studies into this, this new subject now? Well, personally, uh, I am in view uh, of that. Because with uh, citizenship and social development subject, actually students would know more right. so about the history of Hong Kong understand the system in Hong Kong, understand what is one country, two system, right. understand more about China, understand China and its relationship with the outside world. Mm -hmm. So this will actually create some of the values that is much needed as what we have discussed earlier about how to get uh, the youngsters to integrate into GBA. So this subject is playing one of the key role and building up the awareness for our kids. Mm. Rizwan, you are very passionate about the, the youth, development, youth development in Hong Kong, and maybe you, you can, about time for you to share your story with us. I mean, you are, as I said, you are born and bred in Hong Kong. You're just as much a Hong Kong person as I am. Um, have you faced any difficulties when you, when you grew up? Have, have things been very smooth? I mean, you got your PhD um, at Hong Kong U, and you told me some story before the show, and I'm quite, um, impressed, so maybe you can share with the viewers, I mean, what type of challenges you had? Well, looking at me, uh, or looking at myself, uh, like who was born in the 80s, uh, and actually I was, uh, uh, had the unfortunate experience where I don't have access to Chinese language education. And uh, because when I was a teenager, it was about time for Hong Kong to be returned to the motherland. Mm -hmm. And uh, since kid, as a child, I always wanted to and aspire to become a policeman. Oh. But I knew it. Uh, in primary school, I can't be. Why is that? Because I was not learning Chinese language at that time. But did you go to a local school? Well, I went, uh, I went to a local school, but as ethnic minorities, we would be asked to learn other subjects. It was not mandatory for us to learn Chinese language. Right. So we missed that learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
And the other, the other thing is uh, most of the time people would associate it uh, with discrimination. But I think Hong Kong is far much better than other places oh. about <laughs> when you talk about, you know, being discriminated. I think it's more to do with being stereotyped. Mm. You know, people have some bias or maybe have some perception about us. So those might make you feel uncomfortable. But when they know you can speak the Chinese language, Cantonese, they treat you like buddies, right. so we play so football. So you can speak Cantonese? Sure, fluently. And Putonghua as well, I believe? Yeah, that, that is manageable. Yep. Is and manageable. Your, of course English and your mother, your mother language, Udu, right? So you, yeah. you know all languages, in a way. It's, well, you're surviving. <laughs> right. you know, I read in a, there's a, an article in South China Morning Post last year saying that there's a gap in the Chinese language skills for those children from non-Chinese speaking family. And which makes up about three to four percent of our total square enrollments, and I mean they've got access from government funding. But the for, uh, what I read was at the end of the education, the level of Chinese is basically like primary one or primary two. It's quite primitive. Um, why is that happening? Because as you said, at your time you don't have the resources, and now we have the resources. And actually, they said less than seventy percent of those grants were used by only one fifth of the schools. So why isn't it happening with funding and why aren't the Chinese being taught to the ethnic minorities? Well, uh, you see, like in the past 25 years, like I'd say it's less than 20 years when the whole Chinese language learning really come into force. So it was more an experiment, I think, the past uh, 15, 20 years. The focus was on curriculum design and then uh, later it moved on to pedagogy and it seems to me that like there's a lot of uh, government resources, a lot mm, of money mm, is put mm, in mm. this area, and it, it did not yield uh, a massive impact to the Chinese language learning of our children. Most of the time, uh, we have when we look at this issue, it's a very tricky issue when we're looking at this. But to put it simple, if we are living in Hong Kong, we need to master a language to a certain level of proficiency where we can survive and find a job. It's not only further our studies, but we need to learn the language itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I fast forward now and if suppose with the same qualification I have, if the language of my Chinese is not up to par, I still cannot be come mm. and land in my dream job. Right. You know, in the article it also says that some of the ethnic minorities' kids are being uh, segregated into their own groups for learning, rather than integrated with the other Chinese students. And not all the teachers are keen to teach the ethnic minority uh, students. Is that true? Well, uh, unfortunately, yes, it right. is, it right. is right. true. Can anything be done about this? Well, I think, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, apart from administrative procedures or measures, I think from uh, the value education perspective, we need to also teach our local children on the concept of diversity, mm. celebrate differences, mm. how to accept, respect and appreciate different cultures. And even our teachers must have this passion mm. or treat this as mission, uh, 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 treating ethnic minority like other kids in Hong Kong to deliver them the same equitable uh, education to them. If our local kids, they have no problem, our teachers should also be looking in that angle. Mm -hmm. Some are very devoted teachers, mm -hmm. but some, they see the challenges and they might be a little reluctant. Right. But I think this is the area we, we can actually help and change. And we hope five years down the line, we can see some big changes. Mm -hmm. A lot of things is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What exactly is happening? I mean, are, are, there, are, the, are the education bureau people pushing hard on this or they, they also uh, identify this issue? Well, education bureau has always been in this forefront. Uh, Youth Development Commission, when they organize activities, when they look at policies, ethnic minority is there. Uh, Equal Opportunities Commission and many NGOs and even many companies, as part of their corporate social responsibility angle, they're doing a lot of things. But again, synergy, we need to 
have someone to do coherence making right. to achieve that level of synergy. Yep. But now it's just some here, some there, and some there, and the impact might be there, but we don't know. Right. So this is something need to be addressed. Right, Rizwan, in the recent fifth wave pandemic of the Omicron, uh, we also read in the news that at one of the isolation facilities also recruited people from the Indonesian, Filipino, even Pakistani community to help those, uh, I mean, uh, affected individuals who may not be very comfortable with English or Chinese. So in, in your view, has your, has your ethnic minorities having difficulty to get access to vaccination or even tests? Have you seen that? Well, uh, actually, uh, it was a very interesting experience. Uh, like uh, when the fifth wave was at peak, uh, one of my uh, legislator friend mm -hmm. uh, was also distributing some uh, yep. these uh, testing kits mm -hmm. and materials mm -hmm. to ethnic minority f uh, families. And we found that some uh, ladies would not go for vaccination because of some religious restriction. And so uh, we organize a uh, vaccination program in mm. our Kowloon Mosque mm -hmm. uh, in March. And that actually attracted a lot of people to go and get vaccinated on the spot there. We provide uh, segregated vaccination for, uh, by gender uh, to get vaccinated with female doctors and nurses. And also it attracted the local people to go in and take a look uh, mm. in, the, mm. in the mosque mm. as part of a tour and also get vaccinated and the result was very successful. Like putting this uh, experience into other things that we do, I think there's a lot of potential in Hong right. Kong to do well for both ethnic minority and even the youth work in general. Right, just to ask you another, another area that may be a bit of, of controversy. We have Mr. Raj Chattel, the chairman of the Indian Chamber of Commerce here last year, and he said that uh, being, if you're not a, a, a ethnic Chinese, you won't be able to get a return home permit to, to go to China. So without that, would that uh, make that a barrier for the ethnic minority group to also contribute over to the border? Well, actually, I have a lot of friends who have been doing businesses in China. And I remember they, had, uh, they take advantage of the APEC scheme mm. and they can just go through the immigration. Right, so there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it, and I, I'm sure uh, the government can think of something like, for example, like if they're not Chinese national, they, if they're a permanent resident of Hong Kong, if they can be given a special card mm. to go through the immigration and make it convenient mm. rather than uh, a nuisance, right. it will not be a deter. I think administratively, something could be done. Right. Right, that's all the time we have and many thanks to Rizwan for the sharing your inspirational story and also your views on how to unleash the potential of both Chinese and non-Chinese youth in Hong Kong. Stay healthy and have a good week.